<laughs> I think we're going to invite testimony from the audience. Uh, so with that, uh, if anyone wants to make any suggestions, questions, or anything of the, the draft report, please step right up. Tell us what your question is, and we'll try and answer it. <laughs> uh, my name's uh, Ron Hemingway, and I'm from Western Maine. I live in Dixfield, and I represent uh, workers at the paper mill at the New Page Paper Mill in Rumford. Uh, I have about nine, uh, 700 members, and there's probably about 900 or so em employees there. And I also do some state work within uh, USW as well and represent uh, other people throughout the state. I, g I guess my question is, I, I guess I didn't fully understand everything that was going on today and what the purpose of the hearing was. I was actually here more to give testimony on trade in general, not just in the topic that we're hearing about today. So what I was saying is, I, I don't know if there's a better time for me to testify after this after other people want to want to talk, because I think I'm the only one that signed up so far mm -hmm. to talk. So, but no, I think that's definitely appropriate to have her hear uh, the issues that you're. That's why I brought up pulp and paper. Wasn't sure if you were actually going to speak about it or not, but uh, well, I, I plan to. Yes, yeah. actually, it's a it's a great concern for me. Uh, just me in the well, right just, tree. Yes. Okay, um, just to answer your initial question, the um, because people may be listening in also and want to know, the commission is required every two years to do an assessment on um, the impacts of trade on um, the state of Maine. And um, we actually haven't been given a very large budget to do that. Uh, so what we decided to do this year and in some previous years is to focus that assessment on particular Topic. So the previous assessment uh, two years ago was focused on issues um, of procurement, uh, pharmaceuticals, and um, something else, tobacco. And this one, uh, we had a public hearing that focused on specifically food and agriculture issues, and there was a lot of interest in that, especially relating to this new agreement. So we decided to do the assessment on those agriculture issues and this European Union agreement. But that said, I'm totally with uh, the Senate chair in terms of hearing you know, any comments that you might have relating to trade. This is our public hearing. And we're also required to have at least two or three public hearings, two public hearings a year. And this is one of our public hearings. So we're always anxious to hear from the public on any topic relating to trade. And I think that why I thought it was appropriate too is I think Ms. Taylor would agree that some of this stuff falls under agriculture and, and a lot of the USDOL laws too. So as far as um, harvesting and all that, so I mean, it, it, it seems to me to be very appropriate because we're really probably not 100% sure if uh, the wood fiber would maybe fall under the agriculture exemption anyway. So, uh, so with that, you know, by all means, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, okay, I, uh, I also appeared before this commission a, a few years ago, and I was here uh, more related to paper and the paper case. We've, uh, we've experienced a lot of paper dumping in Maine and across the U.S. Uh, mainly it comes more from places like China and Indonesia. Uh, part of what I want to talk about is it's, it's very unfortunate that the government negotiates these trade agreements, and a lot of it is behind closed doors, and we don't know what's in it. So it takes us several years to find out what's going on. In the meantime, there's a lot of pressure on the pricing in the paper market because places like China and Indonesia are dumping their products on us. So the USW and, at the time, New Page had to get together and uh, spend quite a bit of money to bring forward to the federal government a case in front of the uh, Commerce uh, Department of Commerce to say that they're t dumping paper on us and, and they're hurting our businesses and putting us out of work and closing paper mills, which has a long, lot of other fallout in the chemical, wood supply uh, business and all the other industries. And why should we be spending millions of dollars to fight these trade agreements when it's the government that negotiates them? I would think we would uh, put it in that the, the trade agreements should involve that the government should have to pay for any of these uh, any of these battles that we have to have, especially when we win them. Uh, we won ours in the paper uh, segment, but what is also unfortunate is it's a very narrow scope that you're allowed to fight in. 
In the paper industry, there's many grades of paper. And within those grades of paper, you have to determine what grades of paper, if it's groundwood, groundwood free, what weight, if it's coated, uncoated, uh, colored paper, all these different uh, grades that we make, but you can only fight that in one specific category. And when you do, the uh, country like China or other rogue nations that don't care about the trade agreements, they want you to sign them, but they don't want to follow them, what they will do is they just change what their product is slightly, move into a slightly different market, and now we have to start all over again to fight that same battle again. And, you know, in the meantime, by the time it takes us to put a case together and go to court and win, We've shut down more mills, we put more uh, people out of business, we've shut down m many more machines. And it's just, it's a cycle that's going on. I brought some paperwork, which I could share if, if, you, if you're interested, that within the USW, we're, we're a, with the name like USW, United Steel Workers, Paper Workers, Steel Workers of America, we have many industry in there. We're not just steel workers, we're not just paper, we're also uh, nuclear power. We have Harley Davidson motorcycles that, that are being built. We have oil and chemical, uh, we have glass, we have cement, we have rubber tires. We've had to fight these same battles in every industry. We've had to fight them in rubber tires. You're, you're getting a lot of imports from China again, Indonesia. I know China on, on tires and uh, put a lot of tire companies out of business. And these are all primary manufacturing jobs which supports many other jobs, many other sectors of the, of the economy. And we're losing the middle class in the U.S., and a lot of it is because we're taking away the manufacturing base in this country. Uh, I hope what we're not doing with the, with the European Union is we're going to go into a, a trade agreement to bring them down to our standards, because their standards are higher and better than ours. And I think our corporations want to use that to lower the standards there. And I, I think there's a lot of things we, we could do to, to help. And I think there's a lot of things that need to be looked at, and I prepared a few things just for suggestions. And please be patient with me if I bore you. You've probably heard a lot of this before, and I apologize for that. But anyway, I'm saying what we need, I think, is fair trade, not free trade. We need to make sensible rules that every country plays by, and goods for those countries that are in violation should not be allowed access to those markets uh, and the products that are produced from that. When we, do, when we did win the subsidy, we, we won a subsidy against China. It lasts for up to five years. Then, by then, they've done something else in the market, they move a little bit, and we're going to fight that battle again. Or it's going to be Indonesia, and now we're under pressure because we signed another uh, trade agreement with South Korea. So South Korea is the one that is putting all the pressure on the American steel industry right now. What they're doing is they're dumping their products, their steel products, on America at below fair market prices. The governments subsidize what they do, what they build, what they manufacture, so that they can come over here, put the products in the American bit, uh, market, drive our companies out of business. Once we do that, those prices are going to start to rise, and the goods might not be as available. I think we need to look at that for other uh, home security issues as well. Uh, we need fair standards of labor, no child labor, no forced labor or slave labor, or any other immoral practices that produces a race to the bottom. We don't need to get down to uh, the average worker in China, when I looked into it a couple of years ago, we're making $100 a month for, uh, in the paper making industry. We don't need to make $100 a month to compete. That is not what this should be, be about. Uh, we, we need to make sure that there isn't just wages, but there's actually a standard of benefits such as medical and retirement. Our businesses pay for this. How can we ask them to compete with other businesses in other countries that do not pay the same benefits that we pay? And I think we recognize we need those benefits like Social Security and Medicare. And it's interesting, though, there was another trade uh, pact with Colombia that's been promoted a lot. Colombia, by the way, has killed their union leaders, so they wouldn't be free to come here and speak like I can. I think my employer would love me to go down and organize in Colombia. <laughs> we need uh, protection for industry, respect of patent rights. 
Every small or large business that starts doing business with rogue traded partners risk losing their products and business to copyright infringement, fraud, and patent violations, copycat uh, reproductions. We need our government to stand up for its citizens, like I said, and fight these trade cases for us. Currency manipulation, that's another place we're still losing in the paper industry. China manipulates their uh, currency. They lower the, the actual uh, rate for, for trade against the American dollar, and they actually peg it to our currency, though that's always lower than that. I don't think we have that same uh, issue with uh, European trade. I think they're probably uh, a little more conscious of their, of their price. Current, uh, China does it to be able to, to keep their prices artificially low. Uh, they also do predatory pricing. Illegal subsidies hurt us. Given raw materials to their own privately held or government held owned industry, they provide free or low cost electricity, cheap chemicals, and minerals that hurts all of us. It's another place that we can't compete, compete in, a, uh, in a paper industry to buy those products, and the companies we're buying the products from, American industries, can't compete because <laughs> places like China are uh, practically giving that, those materials away. Our uh, manufacturing base is a primary industry. Economics 101 uh, would actually say that you need to take something such as a raw material, add value to it, and then sell it for a price that will pay for the supplies and the labor and still make a profit. If we become just a service industry nation, our economy is going to crumble. We need to buy American when upgrading our infrastructure. We need to create a system where American goods have priority over foreign goods when taxpayer dollars are used. We need to use American labor when possible and promote American goods to the public. There was a bridge, I think it's called the Bay Bridge. You guys might know more about it than I do. But there was a Bay Bridge, a major, you know, multi-million, billion dollar uh, rebuild of a bridge, I believe in California, if I remember right, but the Bay Bridge. Uh, that was made with Chinese uh, steel. They came in, they underpriced the American product. It was behind, it was behind the delivery date it was supposed to be done. Behind, under, it was way over budget. And then they had to come in and uh, practically rebuild it. It ended up costing more than what it would have been done if we had used American products, American people doing the work, and it's putting our people out of business again. We need to be patriotic by protecting our economy, our troops, and our military. We need to clothe our troops with complete American-made gear. This is much larger than just New Balance sneakers. We keep hearing about New Balance sneakers, and I hope they make it. I want to protect them, too. But there's more to it than just that. Their boots, their clothes, all the gear they need should be made in America. If we get into a major war, which some people want to jump into again in the Middle East, and which could expand, if our suppliers don't give us the goods we need to go to war, what are we going to do? I mean, our ships, our, our jets, everything. That, that needs to be made in America. We should be supply chain ready and not relying on countries that can turn off our supplies. We recognize the need for this in petroleum products. Why don't we recognize this in everything else that is crucial to our country? As we lose our manufacturing base, we lose the middle class jobs. The tax base that pays for education, property taxes, Social Security, and Medicare income, taxes that support the entire federal and state existence, and the driver of jobs that supports several levels of other support jobs. There's been a lot of talk about fast track. I went to Washington a few months ago. I talked to all of our delegation while there. Uh, a couple of our delegation is right on board that they will not support any uh, fast track and any trade agreement. A couple others are uh, more hesitant and they want to look at it. Uh, if there's fast track, that just means that we're not going to get a chance to look at it, we're not going to get a chance to debate it, we're not going to protect the American people and, and the economy and our business. Uh, now I understand there's a new name for it. They're going to start bringing something else forward called smart track. It's just another, you know, they're going to clothe it in a different uh, mask and they're going to try to bring it back again with a smarter sounded name. But we have to hold our delegation, uh, you know, to the grindstone that they will not pass anything that doesn't have full debate. We need full debate because, as you hear, just in the agriculture and the milk industry, every industry is, is complicated like that. We need to fully debate every industry that is affected. 
We need full public knowledge, and we don't want to lose our autonomy and our rights to hold uh, companies uh, responsible for the products that are here. We can't let a foreign body as the World Trade Association or World Trade Organization dictate what we're going to do in the U.S. and what we're going to use for products and whether or not we can bring suit against somebody that does something wrong. I thank you very much for letting me speak. I know I'm a little long-winded, but uh, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Hemingway. Any questions? Senator Chairman? Well, yeah, you're... Uh, you're from Arista County, so I picked you. Th thanks for being here. I remember you were here some time ago, and I mentioned I had a Hemingway family in, in, in my district, and uh, you look like one of the younger Hemingways, if I may say that. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I, 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 I do have three general questions, and, I, and I, I don't know much about international trade. Yet we read a lot, and the more you read, the less you understand. I, there's a, I call it the funny book magazine, but it's The Economist. I don't know if you see The Economist comes out once a week in little vignettes around the world. It's kind of a semi-liberal outfit, but uh, th three very specific questions. Uh, w w one of them is you hear about the, uh, our tax policy where businesses in this country uh, keep profits outside of the country so they can't be taxed. Is there, is, what's your, and I'm neither for or against it, what, what would be the chance of not taxing those those monies and having to go back in this country. So have you ever looked at the impact of that? Because they say there's you know, billions of dollars profits that are done outside. Have you dealt with any of that? Uh, I haven't really looked into it, but to me common sense would say, you know, we, we looked at we look at immigration and everything else and every now and then you give a uh, you give amnesty so to speak. I don't think we can do it and then keep doing it and then keep doing it. As a way to get the investment back in the U.S., I think if we had some kind of an amnesty program to bring money back, it might be worth it. But then we need some laws on the books that would keep comp companies from repeating it, knowing that they can bring it back later and not be taxed on it. I think we need to tax companies that have enough profit that they can afford to take it overseas. This is more specific. Uh, I was talking before this group started talking with the uh, governor, Senator King's gentleman in the, in the audience, and, and talked about down in Washington County with the Chinese man in Washington County. And I, you've probably seen that. That's a rather impressive mill down there. What, what's, what's your take on? I don't know if they're getting subsidies or not. What, what, do you have any comments around the? The mill in Woodland, Baileyville, whichever we want to call it. It looks like a big, big, big operation there. And they competing for fiber. What, what, what is it that the impact on new folks? Because I, I, you know, I live 60 miles north of there, and the trucks are going by all the time, loaded with logs that are going down to Baileyville. I've only been there once, and I have limited knowledge of uh, what goes on in Baileyville, but I believe that they've, uh, they're in the process or have just added at least one new tissue machine. Tissue is one of the growing segments in the paper industry, and uh, most of Maine that has had growth that I'm aware of has been in the tissue industry. Uh, unfortunately, Lincoln, for instance, uh, had a major setback when, they, uh, when their boiler blew up, and they, they let their pulp mill fall apart because of it and freeze up. But uh, the tissue industry is probably one of the bright spots. Uh, coated, coated paper and, and other printing papers are, are taking a big hit. Last one also has to do with uh, Washington County. The, uh, they're talking about exporting out of Washington County and they're uh, talking, as you know, they'll knock an east mill, knock it, or down east, what they're going to call it these days, about the torrified wood. Do you have any Inside knowledge or knowledge of whether that is something that would be going forward would be have some value to the state of Maine. I, I only know of it and that they're trying to produce torrified wood there as a substitute for like a coal type of product, I believe. But I uh, I I don't know if it's viable, if it's actually worked out, and what the what the if there's an actual profit market margin or if it's a, a subsidized product. So. 
I know that Millinocket and a whole has had some very n bad news lately, and and uh, they're looking at ripping out one of their paper machines, I believe, in in the old one in order to help pay to restart the other mill. That's all I know about it. One time we had something called Rural Caucus, and, and uh, we were fairly energetic for a while, and then they had a bunch of other caucuses that kind of killed the Rural Caucus. And I, I only, only say that because we had the folks scream before, I, about 15 or 20 of us would get up early in the morning. The rest of these local guys couldn't do it, apparently. And, and we talked about the torrified wood process about eight years ago. And what it is, you're really making charcoal. You take, as you know, you take a, 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 the wood, in effect, chip it up, heat it, and all the volatiles will uh, burn off, and you're left with carbon that they crush, crush into something that looks like uh, uh, charcoal. And what the, what the real issue was, was Great Britain has like 30% uh, of their energy must come from non-greenhouse gas stuff. And that was the sale pitch that they were going to use Milnocket for. And I don't know where that is now. If the, you know, you got really, well, maybe you had some comments on that or know more about it than I do, but it's an interesting concept whether, and it would be, uh, go out of the port down the east port, I guess, with the, with the idea. Yeah, I really don't have any, any more information that I could share at this time with it. The, the, only, the only other bright spot that I know of has been, uh, in uh, Old Town, I believe, there, uh, there's some work going on there to try to use like a black liquor type of product, which is a byproduct of making pulp, uh, trying to use that for like a jet fuel or some kind of a diesel fuel. And I really don't know where that's advanced to yet, how, how successful they've been. I Basically, Mr. <clears throat> Chairman, I just wanted to let the group know that uh, Ron is my uh, local Pre, uh, union president in Rumford. Uh, we have fought a good fight on the uh, paper dumping issue. Uh, and I would say that uh, I have uh, been on this commission since the start. And I remember seeing the documentary Trading Democracy by Bill Moyers in the three words that have changed my life forever is tantamount to expropriation. Uh, and uh, f since then, I realized that uh, these free trade agreements done in, in secret uh, with no transparency and fast track, not bringing it to Congress, debating and given Congress the right to amend has scared me. But the, the thing of it is, since I've been on this commission, every trade agreement that I've seen is looking to uh, the harmonization of all the lowest possible standards and regulations which uh, scare me, but the other thing is the lowest possible standards and the highest possible level of profitability with the right to sue for potential loss of profit, profits has uh, moved me uh, to such that I want to continue this process, and I thank you for bringing your comments forward. Hey, Ron. Uh, I just want to tell you that I was aware of the dumping of the steel after we signed this, oh, not we, but after they signed the South Korean Free Trade Act. Now they're dumping all the steel. And uh, I reached out to our delegation, and Senator King's uh, office got back to me, and he signed on a letter, I think, with 96 other representatives and senators opposing that. So I, think, I thought that was very positive. Um, but it shouldn't be the steel industry that has to fight this. It should absolutely be the government. They signed the deal. With the South Koreans, if they're going to violate it, then it should be our government that's fighting those things. I absolutely agree with you on that. So thank you for what you do.